Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. We all set? Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate you coming here for our daily update on our response to COVID-19 by, uh, of course, uh, Erie County and its various units, offices, and departments. I appreciate you being here. Today we're joined by Karen and Kendra from uh, Deaf Access Services who are providing the American Sign Language, so we thank them for their good work. And after Karen's huge stint a few days ago, as you noticed, we're now going down to two speakers. Karen's over there for now. Kendra's up right now. Uh, and we do want to give you, uh, uh, everyone in the community, the opportunity to get information. Uh, this uh, we're, is in all likelihood the last in-person conference, uh, press conference that we're doing with local media. We are going to try to do a pool one in the future. Some of you may have heard that my colleague in Suffolk County, Steve Ballone, is currently in quarantine as a result of exposure to a case from an employee. Uh, and unfortunately, Steve and many of his uh, key personnel, are my understanding, are in quarantine, and so are some members of their media who were in touch with the county executive. So we're trying to reduce the potential for spread in the community because we don't know if anybody in this room may have it. Hopefully no one does. I don't believe anybody is showing symptoms, but I want to advise everyone that those are the concerns that are going on is to help provide community spread as Sandra pushes a little further away from my uh, podium here now. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, but we just want people to understand these are the issues they're dealing with. Uh, I know I have texting back and forth with Steve last night, and he's doing well, but uh, it's not really appropriate and in a bad time for the county executive and some of his key members of his staff to have to go in quarantine because they do know they were in contact with an individual who tested positive. So we're probably going to be the last uh, live press conference with media in the room. We're going to try to set it up so that all media outlets have an opportunity to ask questions, and we'll have a pull camera in the future. Uh, it's just a, a better way as we deal with this uh, ongoing crisis. Uh, of course, uh, the information that is being presented today is, is in, in the PowerPoint, and what we provide you here is as uh, up-to-date as we possibly can have. There are a constantly changing fluid situation, uh, and uh, we are doing our best to provide you the most up-to-date information. Some of you are probably wondering why I'm wearing glasses. Well, for those of you who do know, I do need reading glasses, and we've gone to, instead of one big page, three smaller pages, which when I, after I printed it, I realized I need to wear glasses. <laughs> Otherwise, I can't read it. So uh, the things that happen when you turn into your 50s. Uh, and of course, the participants, we have a number of individuals here. Our Health Commissioner, Dr. Gail Burstein, once again. Uh, we're joined by Under Sheriff uh, Mark Whipperman from the Erie County Sheriff's Office. I thank him and his team for the work that they've done in cooperation with us. We're also joined by our Commissioner of Emergency Services, Homeland Security, uh, Dan Neverth. We also have in the room Deputy County Executive uh, Maria White, uh, some members of our staff. Uh, we've kept some other commissioners out of the room and that are here and doing active role because we're trying to reduce the number of people in this room. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we're going tomorrow to uh, uh, more of a pool uh, press conference. So yesterday, oops. Uh, yesterday, uh, tests were completed at the Erie County Public Health Lab on 21 samples. Uh, the tests, the original batch of tests were inconclusive. So we decided to retest all samples and add another 20 samples to the test, which resulted in 41 samples in total, which was run late evening with results available this morning. That is why you did not receive any results yesterday. Uh, the samples were fine. There wasn't any issue with the samples, but we just wanted to redo it. We didn't think that it was going to be an issue, or we thought there was an issue with the way the tests came back inconclusive, so we decided to rerun them. And as a result, 41 samples were run this morning. As you know, because I recently announced it, there are four new positive cases in Erie County. Of the 41 samples that uh, were run last night with results this morning, 25 were negative, four were positive from the Erie County residents. There were 29 residents, uh, and uh, 12 samples were conducted for individuals that reside in other counties. And if there are any positive results with regards to those samples, they will be announced and released by the other counties. So once again, 41 tests in full were run with the results available to us this morning. 29 from Erie County, 12 from other counties, 25 in Erie County were negative, four were positive. We'll go into those positives right now. Uh, 
The first is a, a female in her 50s who is isolated in a local hospital negative pressure room. I'll give the media a little time. The second is a female in her 50s with no recent travel and is currently in isolation at a private residence. We believe that this is the first case of community spread in Erie County. We have no reason based on the individual's history to believe they did not catch it anywhere else but in this community. The third is a male in his 40s with recent travel out of state and is currently in isolation in a private residence. Once again, the third is a male in his 40s with recent travel out of state and is currently in isolation in a private residence. And the fourth is a male in his 30s with recent travel out of state and is currently in isolation at a private residence. The four uh, cases in no particular order once again. There are two new cases from the city of Buffalo. Two new cases from the town of Amherst with one of those cases in the town of Amherst being an individual who resides in the village of Williamsville. I have advised Mayor Brown, Supervisor Culpa, and Mayor Rogers of Williamsville of these cases. We are not identifying the particular individuals, of course, but uh, did I advise them that there were new cases in their community when it came to Buffalo and Amherst? and uh, one case which now is in the village of Williamsville, which also is incorporated in the town of Amherst. Uh, that brings the total of cases in Erie County to 11. But as we have said before, we believe there is more, and there are more cases that are existing in our community. We just haven't tested those individuals, and now we have our first case of community spread from one of those individuals. To go into further detail about what we believe are public exposures and to advise the public on our concerns with regards to the individuals uh, that have tested positive, we've been able to acquire some more information. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Doc Burstein, bring up her little step stool, because there is a slight difference in height between the two of us. It's a couple inches. Yeah. And uh, so, Doc, I'll flip it for you. Thanks. So, <clears throat> so we um, we have from our uh, a very detailed uh, uh, case investigation identified locations where these cases were um, during the time where they were symptomatic and able to transmit uh, disease. So remember. Um, this is thinking about a 14-day incubation period. So if people have identified that they were in one of those locations, they should make sure that they are self-monitoring um, for 14 days from the time that they were in those uh, same locations, which are on March 10th between 10 a.m. and 11.30 a.m., uh, the, one of the cases was at Barnes & Noble on Niagara Falls Boulevard in Amherst. On March 10th, between 7 and 8 p.m., one of the cases was in the Harlem Road Community Center in Amherst. On March 11th, between 10.30 and 11.30 a.m., one of the cases was in the Williamsville Library. On March 11th, between 7 and 8 p.m., one of the cases was at the Lexington Market and at the 7-Eleven in Elmwood Village on Elmwood. And then on March 13th, one of the cases was on Southwest Flight 2442 uh, for, from Fort Lauderdale to Buffalo. So uh, again, we are uh, continuing to do uh, testing in our public health lab and continuing to collect the, uh, the swabs, the specimens for testing um, by our public health nurses um, out in the community. So, uh, so far we have tested a total of 86 Erie County residents, of which 11 have been positive, 75 have been negative, and we believe um, as by the end of the day, we will have uh, a, a total of 
225 specimens to be tested. So we are really ramping up our specimen collection and testing capabilities. Again, test results, um, we're letting people know will be available um, within uh, 24 to 72 hours, uh, depending on the, uh, the volume of the testing that we receive. So our uh, public health lab, again, is, um, is doing the testing. And, um, and we, again, we have you know, changed the criteria because we, believe, we know now that we have community spread. So um, people who, are, uh, who are, have, are symptomatic, and so symptoms with either a fever and uh, we need a cough or shortness of breath. So two criteria, fever and cough or shortness of breath which are indicative of a lower respiratory tract infection. Again, uh, we're also looking at people's travel history. So, uh, so um, the, and the travel is for the places that we've uh, always had. I'm looking at China, South Korea, Iran, Italy, and Japan in the uh, past 14 days. So remember, if people meet the criteria for symptoms with or without travel, or they've had travel in those identified countries, they should either contact their primary care provider to uh, work with us to do the testing. If they don't have a primary care provider, we've actually trained people in my Epi and Surveillance Office, and they will be able to collect the relevant information for people who feel they need to get tested, and then uh, work with those individuals to uh, determine whether a person can get tested or not, and authorize that testing. So people do not need a primary care provider to get the testing. However, if people are ill, and they feel that they need a medical evaluation, we, know we cannot provide that advice over the phone. So if and those individuals that want to be evaluated by a, a medical clinician, they should either go, again, go to their primary care provider, uh, go to an urgent, or go to an urgent care center. They are all prepared to, uh, to see these patients. So uh, looking at the uh, number of individuals who have been our uh, quarantine and isolation. So again, all the positive cases are in mandatory isolation. So they're sick and they're staying away from the rest of the community. We're trying to isolate them um, and remove that transmission risk from the rest of the community. And then we are, uh, so far we have uh, 53 contacts in mandatory con uh, quarantine. And um, as we continue to do the case investigations on those other in individuals who are newly positive, we will increase that number of people who are in mandatory quarantine. So again, um, we are uh, prioritizing our monitoring of, uh, of individuals by the health department for, uh, for family members or close contacts of people who have a positive COVID-19 uh, test result. Also, we are, are, are trying to monitor people who are at risk of becoming very ill, and we know that's the elderly and then people with other chronic conditions. And then another big group that we're very concerned about is our healthcare provider workforce. So any healthcare providers who could have potentially been um, exposed either by a close contact or a proximal contact or relevant history or um, people working in a medical facility, those individuals were really trying hard to, uh, to, to monitor. So, uh, so again, we're reaching out to the community, to um, everybody work together to try to keep our numbers down. And so we really want people just to, you know, shelter down, just to stay at home. So again, um, we assume that if you go out, anytime you go out, um, looking at the pl new places today, um, you could have been exposed to a COVID-19 case, even though they haven't been identified yet. So it's really important that uh, people think about staying at home as much as they can, really try to limit non-essential travel. So again, we know we all have to go buy groceries. Um, we, you know, we all need to you know, perhaps uh, go to um, healthcare provider uh, appointments, especially for ill, or we have a chronic disease that needs maintenance. However, everything else, I think we really need to limit. 
And again, people should be aware of their bodies, of their health conditions, because uh, they should be uh, checking their temperatures, just making sure if you don't have a thermometer, uh, go, you can go to the drugstore and purchase one, or you, um, you know, if you have a fever, you know, you can tell, like, you really feel sick. So just think about, you know, where your temperature is twice a day. Um, just, you know, just double check with yourself if you have a cough or shortness of breath twice a day. And then if you do, um, you should really uh, go to uh, talk to your health care provider or uh, call the, our local health department, our Erie County Department of Health, um, if, you do, if you do not have a local health care provider. And again, um, you know, being paying attention to those locations and those times and dates where you know there was a positive case is very important. However, we also know that there are lots of other places where positive people who are infected with COVID-19 have been that we're just not aware of. So it's really important that we work together and try to reduce transmission. So um, again, we have a, uh, a hotline for information, and that is, number is 8 Five eight two nine two nine. Again, it's eight five eight two nine two nine. We've in, we've increased our our calling capabilities. We have more people manning those phone lines. However, our call volume is still very very high. So people should expect to be on hold and have to wait for a certain amount of time before they can talk to a, a live uh, individual. If, um, and, and also, we're really trying to answer relevant questions that people have based on an experience or, um, you know, a situation, you know, in their lives. We're really not trying to avoid any hypothetical questions. Uh, for people who want other, um, other forms of information, there's a lot of really good, credible information online both that um, our Erie County Health Department has a website devoted specifically to COVID-19 that has a great, in, great information. Also, the New York State Health Department and the uh, CDC also have some great information on their websites where you can, on COVID-19, that you can get some great information. So you don't necessarily have to wait to, a per, uh, to speak to a person live. Thank you, Doc. Uh, as you know, we are in a state of emergency in Erie County as well as New York State. The state of emergency was effective as of yesterday. Uh, the schools are, of course, closed. I ordered the closure on Monday, and now they are closed through April 20th. We are receiving, uh, well, that was after a conference call with the super school superintendents uh, that they've closed until April 20th. However, we are also uh, receiving guidance from New York State on that, so we will continue to uh, update the school superintendents and others with regards to that guidance on the closure and of course all Erie County libraries are closed after consultation with Mary Jean Jakubowski the uh, uh, executive director of the library system we both agreed that we should close the libraries until further notice uh, that is not to say uh, the libraries may not open again in the near future but they want we want to confirm that it is a safe place to go before we would ever open those up again so that is uh, the case with that uh, of course, all bars, restaurants, theaters, gyms, casinos are closed as of 8 p.m. yesterday. Takeout food only. The Erie County Department of Health is inspecting and enforcing with the Erie County Sheriff's Office uh, those rules. And when we talk about the 50% rule for businesses, that is all businesses. We've had a lot of questions. What businesses apply to the 50% rule? And the answer is all. It doesn't matter if you're General Motors or a nail salon. They all apply to the 50% rule. They all have to find a way to reduce their workforce by 50%. So we want people to understand and business leaders that just because you believe you prepare and build an essential product does not necessarily mean it, uh, make, you, make it so, and you have to reduce your workforce by 50%. If the governments have to do it, why would we not do it for some businesses that are not essential that we know? That is the standard as of today, except it does not apply to hospitals, mass transit, law enforcement, nursing homes, and retail establishments, including grocery stores, that is in effect until further notice from New York State. So we want businesses to understand that this is going to be taken seriously. We're getting reports of businesses operating at full capacity when they shouldn't. Uh, we do have representatives of the Erie County Sheriff's Office. The undersheriff here will talk a little bit more about that. I know New York State Police is taking this seriously, as well as others. 
So unless you're one of the exemptions, you don't apply. So it doesn't matter how big you think you are or how important you are. You do need to follow the 50% cut. Uh, this is a very important one coming up right now. Large gatherings are ordered to be canceled or postponed. Over 50 people are present in effect until further notice from New York State. And as we know, the federal government is recommending no more than 10. We think that's a good recommendation as well. Right now, the law in New York State is 50. If you are over 50 mass gathering events, you will be shut down. Uh, we received notice earlier today of a mass gathering event that was going on and uh, it was incumbent upon us to try to shut it down. We're still getting more information on that. But these are the rules, folks. Just because you think you're important doesn't make you important. You're not more, any, more important than anyone else. We are all in this together, which means we all need to follow the same rules. And uh, I know some of the calls that have been coming into the hotline have been business owners saying, uh, well, I need to continue. I know you feel that way, but Depending on what you manufacture, you may not be essential. So therefore, you need to follow the rules except for these few exemptions. And this is a big one. We are currently at less than a five-day supply of blood. If you are healthy and eligible, please consider donating. We have individuals that have, of course, are going to need major surgeries in the next few days. Most elective surgeries have been postponed or canceled by hospitals, but we do know that there are individuals that are going to need blood. And we are down to a five-day supply of blood. So we're asking individuals who donate, if you're healthy and eligible, please consider donating. You know how to get a hold of your blood banks, the Red Cross and the like. Uh, they will limit the amount of individuals at any one time to prevent the possible community spread. But we do need people to donate blood. Of course, we have many COVID-19 resources, including our hotline, 858-2929, our website, eriecounty.gov backslash COVID-19, and the health department and the CDC's website, which is as simple as coronavirus.gov. We have information in English, and we also have in information in Spanish for the Spanish speakers out there. There's a Spanish page that is available. We've been highlighting it on the social media for some days now. Uh, we have lots of emergency support functions in Erie County. Uh, you can imagine we've brought together all of our various departments and offices to address this. And one of the largest emergency support functions, of course, is the Erie County Sheriff's Office. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to the Under Sheriff Mark Whipperman to give a little description of some of the issues that they are dealing with and rules that they will be implementing. Under Sheriff. Thank you, County Executive. Uh, I'd like to start off by uh, stating and clearing up some maybe some mis misinformation that was being reported last night on uh, social media. At this date and time, we have zero cases of suspected COVID-19 and no one under quarantine with our jail management population at both the holding center and the correctional facility and we have no staff members under quarantine or suspected of COVID-19. Uh, I hope and pray it stays this way. If it doesn't, we have plans in place and staff, adequate staff to deal with it. Again, at this date and time, the number is zero. This morning, uh, the sheriff and I, with the cancellation of courts and other public uh, buildings where we have staff, have redeployed them to the front lines. Uh, they are assisting the health department. Uh, they are assisting uh, Commissioner Neverth, and they are ready and willing to respond to any emergency that arises. Again, this is a fluid situation. When things come up, we have adequate staff in place to respond. Uh, we have our, we maintain in a separate command post, so uh, we keep away from each other. We have folks with, uh, ready to go at a moment's notice. And again, working with these individuals and at the same time maintaining uh, an off location command post so we have no fear of ever shutting down uh, due to COVID-19. Switching over to the jail management division. Uh, as announced on March 12th, uh, we have to continue with the lockdown. No outside individuals will be allowed in. Uh, no inmate, all inmate programs suspended. 
uh, because those individuals come in from the outside. As I said, we have zero cases so far. Uh, the barrier is working. We hope and pray it continues. Uh, we are, I walked by the video of his instructions and uh, our press information officer will repost that on social media so everybody has access to it. Uh, also, we want to remind people if you show up at the holding center and you are not there to post bail or to retrieve personal property, people as possible coming into both the correctional facility and the holding center. Uh, things that have changed for us in Police Services Division, uh, so I could probably speak for the suburban ring departments too in Erie County. Um, we're asking individuals, when you call for police service and you get a call taker or dispatcher, depending on what location you're calling, will you please inform the dispatcher or call taker if you're suffering from some kind of ailment, if you have a sore throat, uh, if you have a cough, uh, let them know so they can tell the deputy responding or the officer that the, what they're going to be encountering. Uh, this virus is silent and inv invisible. So we need to keep our men and women on the front lines as healthy as possible. We do have contingency plans in place based on a 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%. Staff reduction, if we have to put our people in quarantine, we do not want to use uh, th those game plans. Speaking for the Sheriff's Office, uh, individuals calling us for service. This is not emergency, not in progress calls. Uh, starting this morning and forthcoming to, to the future, um, if you have a situation, uh, for instance, your credit card was tampered with, you're driving home from work, a, a rock hit your windshield, uh, your mailbox was damaged, you received a phone call from a suspicious phone call for somebody looking for your credit card information, uh, the deputy is not going to respond to your house for one-on-one -on -one contact. We're going to attempt to do it all by phone and email and fax. Um, those individuals who don't have access to it, do not worry. We will handle your case one way or the other. Um, two more things. Number one, uh, we've, we've received some phone calls. I've had some personal elderly family members call and state that Meals on Wheels has a shortage of volunteers and other social services uh, units that deliver medicine and food to our, our military veterans, our disabled veterans, the senior citizens, our handicapped friends. Um, there is not a shortage yet in this county, but do not worry. We've done it in past state of emergencies. Uh, everybody will get food and medicine. Uh, we're ready to redeploy and shuffle the deck. Uh, do not worry about it. We will be there for you. Uh, you've paid lifelong of taxes. It's the least service that we can provide you. And lastly, uh, to repeat what the county executive said, um, we all, people in this room, we all have friends that are the support families that are waitresses and bartenders, uh, that own small businesses and restaurants. Uh, this is a really tough time. Um, the sheriff's office doesn't want to respond to a bar or a restaurant because somebody is violating these, these tough rules. Uh, we want to work with you. Um, we know we're going through a tough time. We're not here to rub salt in the wound. But these are the recommendations from our medical experts federally, uh, at the state level, Dr. Bernstein and others. Um, this is what we have to do to get past this. So all we're asking you for is your cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Under Sheriff. Uh, the Under Sheriff talked about the holding center in the jail. Uh, the as of today, the youth detention facility on East Ferry is in uh, same. There is no family visitation. Uh, we know that this is very traumatic for some because we have people, children under the age of 17, who are in the youth detention facility. Uh, we do not have a case. We do not have a suspected case in the youth detention, uh, detention facility. Uh, similar to what the undersheriff talked about with regards to the holding center, with regards to staff or students, and we want to keep it that way, children. So unfortunately, uh, uh, family visitation is unavailable at this time at the youth detention facility. Uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce also to the podium our um, uh, commissioner of the Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Services, Dan Navarro, to give an update on some of the things that they're working on. 
Thank you, County Executive. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you did see a slide a little bit earlier with regards to emergency support functions, and I just wanted to provide a visual for that because I think, especially during this particular incident, it's absolutely critical that um, you understand exactly how the emergency management of this particular issue is taking place. So if you take a look at the different ESFs, that traditional model that we used to see, everybody would come out to the emergency operations center, it'd be a beehive of hundreds of people from all different agencies. Law enforcement would have ECSO, the sheriff's office, the state police, federal representatives. Uh, we, the, the conventional wisdom used to be pull as many people in to get as many things done as possible. ESFs essentially work on representatives from each of those support functions could be one, could be two, it's definitely not a whole bunch, that can reach out. So if we have representatives from, say, the sheriff's office working with us on a particular shift, and in, an item comes in, a phone call comes in that needs to be addressed by a local law enforcement agency or the state police, they all talk to one another on a regular basis. That information goes directly to that agency, so it reduces that need for us to have 100 people in a room. We can have 100 people working collectively in 100 different positions. So essentially what we're looking at is the ESF's transportation through communications, public works. A lot of these are the day-to-day -day operations. I'm not going to tell Commissioner Geary how to run his operation. He knows how to run it. If I have a question that needs to be related, if I have to have something that needs to be transported by the health ESF, we communicate with one another, and that's how we get things done in a much more concise manner. So I just wanted you to have the visual there uh, uh, that just because there aren't volumes of people that are working necessarily in one physical location, this is the ideal situation for us to work through our emergency support function and take advantage of those relationships that we have. Those relationships include our partnerships with all of the towns, villages, and cities. I want to remind everyone out there that your town supervisor, your mayor, or your chief elected official has an emergency manager that works within that community. The volunteer fire services can work directly through those emergency managers. Requests that are actually required requests not request because this is the state of emergency and we think that there's things that possibly should be replenished, can be worked through your emergency managers to the county level and then ultimately to the state level. We have over the years planning for pandemics, planning for a lot of these things, worked out a number of different issues, including the drive-through clinics that are currently being used, single locations uh, that are being moved around. We have the ability to ramp them up. We have, through our partnerships and through that collaboration, actually could ramp them up well beyond what we're doing now once we have the availability to be able to test more and have more test kits to do. So that's the type of relationship building that's been going on many, many, many years before this rolled out. We are ready to go. We have those partnerships in place. We have the cooperation. As part of our ESF checklist, we have been reassured and we have been contacted from some of the, the, the top uh, business officials in Erie County, in Western New York, that have reassured us that whatever it is we need, uh, they are there for us. And that's going to be critical as we move along. But I think more importantly, from a community standpoint, those relationships are going to be huge once the, the fog of this incident that we're in has cleared and we need to move the economy and we need to move everybody forward. So we have been reassured on any number of levels. We are constantly getting requests from people that are offering essentially their services, retired physicians, uh, folks that have worked in emergency services, folks that have worked in all of the departments in the past that maybe have retired that want to come in and volunteer. Right now, it's a matter of calculating what our true needs are as opposed to maybe overreaching on some of the resources. So that's just a brief update on what we're doing. We do have a list that we can eventually provide the towns and villages that have declared states of emergency, which again is, is more a protection for them and the opportunity from the emergency, the state of emergency and the emergency orders that could potentially come from that so that if they need to maybe move forward some of the initiatives that are coming out as a result of this, it makes the path for them to do that much easier. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Neverth. I'm very glad you covered the ESFs because even with my glasses on, the font is too small for me to read <laughs> on that page with regards to the uh, emergency support functions. Uh, three comments and then we'll open up the questions. Uh, first, uh, as you know, our restaurants and our, our entertainment business, so to speak, is going to be taking a huge hit. 
and restaurateurs that are remaining open still can sell product uh, to take out and delivery. And we're asking you to do that, to shop with them, to call, to charge your order over the phone, have it delivered. There's protocols that are being put in place if you come to pick it up for takeout so that individuals are not contacting each other. But we want to ensure that we can keep these restaurateurs going as long as they can because we don't know how long this is going to last. Uh, and it's important that people take advantage of it. Uh, and we allow some of our restaurateurs and their employees to continue uh, because while the president was talking earlier about a stimulus, uh, we don't know how long it would take for a stimulus package to be approved and the money to be released to individuals across our country. We want to assure everybody that we're going to do our best as a community to purchase uh, food from restaurants so that the restaurants can survive and their employees can get paid. Uh, the second thing, and, and this really bothered me, I was exceptionally hot this morning. Uh, as you may have seen, there was a false Twitter page that was created that looked like one of the local television stations but was not and had put on there a false report regarding someone who had tested positive at a local soup, worked at a local supermarket, which was false. The page was a fake. It was impersonating one of the local television stations. Uh, we are in an emergency situation, and that's a crime. And the hockey player in me, if you were next to me, I would have cleaned your clock. And the sheriff, I don't know if you would have arrested me for assault or not. But you are putting people's lives in danger. We started to get contacts about, is this true? Why aren't you reporting it? This is not a funny situation. And I am deadly serious about this. It is a crime to impersonate someone else. In an emergency situation like this, it is not a joke to put false information out there. It is a crime. And we are working with Twitter to identify who that individual was. Maybe we'll find out. Maybe we won't. If we do, I guarantee you, you are going to get prosecuted to the full extent of the law. This is serious. You shouldn't be doing this. We know you shouldn't be doing it. If someone thought it was a joke, ha ha, great. But it's a crime. You're putting people in, at risk. If you were the worked at that location, that grocery store that was referenced, I know it because our social media started to get responses. I was like, is this true? Why didn't you announce it? Folks, take this seriously. I don't want to see this ever again. I don't want to see a single false report. I don't want to see someone trying to fake pages of other media outlets or elected officials because not only are you doing a disservice to the greater community, you are committing a crime. We are all in this together. And that's the final point. We are all in this together, as I've said over and over and over. We have to work together to protect our neighbors, to protect the residents of our state and our country. If we are not doing that, we are not going to be able to stop the continued spread of COVID-19. We're asking for people to act appropriately. The Sheriff's Office has noted if they find and get information and get on scene of individuals who are breaking the law with regards to operation of businesses and so forth, they will shut them down. New York State is taking this seriously. We all have to take this seriously, which means we all have to think about not only ourselves and our family, but our neighbors and everyone in our greater community. I know we can do it. We've done it before as a community, especially during some of the incredible storms we've had in the past. If you had asked me when I first ran for county executive that county executive, you would have dealt with a snowstorm that dropped seven feet of snow, I would have said, you're crazy. But we got through that because as a community, we rallied together. The sheriff's office was delivering food and, and pharmaceuticals to individuals in need. People came together and said, what can we do to help out? And we're getting that same response from so many people who are contacting our office asking, what can I do? And sometimes, really, the only thing you can do right now is to stay away from others. So you do not infect yourself from someone who may have it, or if you do have COVID-19, you infect others. We have response mechanisms in place, and we're activating them as appropriately. And I thank every single individual who's actually out there asking, what can I do? How can I volunteer? But we are saying, if we need you, we will contact you. In the meantime, the best thing you can do is follow the rules, stay at home, grab the board games with the kids, go outside, throw the football around in your yard. Our parks are still open. People are going for hikes. That's fine. We're not doing mass hikes and things like that. 
But we want people to understand that uh, times have changed from where we were just a week ago, nevertheless where we were a month ago. And we're asking for everyone, we're in this boat together, let's act appropriately so that we can protect as many people in our community. Because if you get the disease and have minor illnesses, if you get COVID-19 and have a minor illness, it's good for you that you only have a minor illness, but you could pass it on to a family member, a neighbor, or someone else and kill them. The death toll in New York State keeps rising, and I expect it to keep rise, rising for quite some time. The best way we can keep that number from continuing to rise is to do our part and truthfully follow the rules with regards to practicing smart social distancing, physical distancing, and acting appropriately for our fellow man. With that, I open up to any questions. Multiple questions about the testing protocol because there's at least two changes that I noted. Uh, not the first change, do I have this correct? That the travel change is that if they've traveled to those five nations within the last 15 days, uh, 14 days, and the other change um, in regards to those that don't have primary care physicians is that they should go to an urgent care center um, they, if they, uh, for people who do not have a primary care physician to be able to help them um, assess their illness and coordinate the testing, um, we are recommending that um, if they feel they do not need a medical assessment, they can call our Erie County Health Department, the, the 858-2929, and then they'll get transferred to a, uh, a, a trained uh, a epidemiologist to uh, get a good history and will able to evaluate whether that person is eligible for testing. If a person uh, feels that they need a medical assessment, they have to be seen by a health care provider, and they don't have a primary care provider, then they should uh, seek care at an urgent care center. So if they do not have a primary care physician, they call the health department? Right, they can, and yes. Has changed from the last two days where you said call an urgent care center? Right. We realized that there was a need that, unfortunately, there are many people in our community that do not have a primary care provider. So. Uh, we didn't want to. Uh, we went, didn't want to make it difficult for them to get access to testing. So we were able to uh, to you know train some staff and to be able to accommodate those needs. So I talked with a, a number of folks, including one medical director at, a, at an urgent care center, who was surprised that people were calling his place and said, "How do you need to call the health department?" Well, uh, we were not recommending that they uh, call for uh, advice. Uh, we recommend that they should call ahead, let them know they're coming, so that the uh, so that the uh, uh, urgent care center could take the appropriate actions with having expecting them, um, having p um, a mask available for that individual, and being able to usher them back directly into an exam room, so they don't sit in the waiting room and expose other individuals. So that's why I wanted them to call ahead to allow the urgent care center to prepare for that individual's visit. Next question what from Sandra. Mean, Sandra. Um, yeah, I have a, a ton of questions because I'm asking questions on behalf, on behalf of like half a dozen reporters in the newsroom. Um, the first is Cuomo News Talk has estimated that there are like 55,000 to 100,000 beds of hospital beds that will be needed uh, in the state. And if you were to extrapolate that down to the county, that would be like more than 6,000 beds needed here. You only have about a third of that amount. So I'm interested mm -hmm. to know um, if the county is doing anything to help coordinate efforts to find more hospital beds. I know you spoke about the Yes. The question for those of you at home was, is Erie County doing it, making an effort to try to identify more hospital beds? Uh, yes, we are. Uh, every day I've, I've, put, I've requested the CEOs of the uh, three major hospital units to provide us their uh, daily listing of beds that are available, not just total beds, but also those that are, uh, have staffing associated with them. So we are getting those numbers, which truthfully are fluctuating by the hour, but we're asking it for just to be provided in the morning so we have a good idea. They're also providing that information to the health department. Uh, but we are working with our partners uh, in the healthcare industry and, and government to find additional locations. Uh, there is a hospital that was recently closed in Irving in Chautauqua County, Lakeshore, uh, that uh, literally closed within the last two months. Uh, I was on the, uh, I was texting, not on the phone, I was well, texting on the phone with the former Chautauqua County Executive George Borello, who's now State Senator, and they are working in Albany to get that facility authorized and up for additional hospital beds. 
Uh, and the nice thing is there are still some equipment and supplies there. However, of course, there would be more that would be needed as well as staff for it. Uh, so we do know that there's going to be a much greater need in this community. If somebody, uh, if they want me to go out and say, do we have enough beds to cover what we think is coming? I can't give you that answer and say yes, I have to say no. Uh, and we're working with the current hospital units as well as our partners uh, elsewhere. And as I noted a couple of days ago, we're even looking at potentially reopening uh, the portion of the Erie County home to address the need. Uh, if it grows at a rate that uh, we're hoping it doesn't, but it may, uh, we're gonna need more beds with regards to ICU beds as well as general beds. I can't give an answer on how many we need. It's all based on hypotheticals. Uh, and our goal is to try to get as many and open up as many beds as possible. We're looking at alternatives, uh, hotels. We're looking at potentially, uh, if we have closed hotels, reopening hotels. Uh, if not, uh, we are going to take actions necessary to give us the number of locations we possibly could be. Uh, nursing homes, there's been some nursing homes that are in the process of closure or have closed recently. Uh, we've had con early conversations with some. Uh, they're not 100% happy with the idea that we may ask them to reopen the facility. Uh, but if we need it for the community, we'll do it because I need to have as many potential locations. And of course, a nursing home and an old closed hospital are, would be the number one because they have the capability of basically being a healthcare facility already. The separate rooms, usually separate bathrooms, separate HVAC. Uh, so we're looking at all of those. Uh, but if you're asking for an exact number of what we're anticipating, I can't give you that. Uh, but once again, we, we, we are planning to address the worst and hope for the best. Good, a few other questions? And be, I, a couple, and then we'll go on to some others, and then we'll come back. Um, in regard to child care, uh, I don't know if that's something the county is coordinating. Yes. They announced that uh, the closure of libraries. There are a lot of students who are getting these distance learning materials or being asked to like learn from home, and a lot of that requires computer access. Um, libraries are one of the few places they could actually go to actually do their homework, get access to any of the educational material they need. So what are, what are families supposed to do if they uh, the question was about libraries and the closure of the libraries. As, you, as I noted, we are not, have not closed them indefinitely. We're working on potentially opening up libraries, including maybe even on a rotating basis where they're only open a couple days a week and it moves around the county depending on where they are. Uh, one of the concerns from the librarians was parents often drop off their kids and treat it as a daycare, even if it's only for two hours or so. And then they have children that are unaccompanied in their libraries. That's not good. Uh, so what we are doing is working with the library system and the independent board of trustees that exist. We will be uh, possibly reopening libraries on a rotating basis to assist families and communities that may need to access information. Uh, my understanding is the library uh, board has waived all fees through at least think the end of April. The information is on the library site, so if you have a book that needs to be returned. You could, of course, drop it off in the, the book return boxes outside most libraries. But if you have any fees, those will be waived. Uh, but it is something that we're working on. It's all work in progress. Daycare, uh, we have a child care task force that is uh, headed up by our deputy county executive and our commissioner of social services. Uh, so Maria White and Marie Cannon are running that. And it's my understanding that the first uh, conference call, big meeting of the, all the various parties, the child care network, uh, the, the, I think even the Community Foundation and others are, uh, are, are is going to be tomorrow so that we hopefully can get open by the end of this week, if not uh, sooner, though that might be a little bit of a stretch. Uh, some facilities for individuals that work in public safety, hospitals, and of course uh, government that needs to be open. This will not be child care for just the general public. These will be for f uh, children of uh, parents that work in the, uh, the medical profession, the healthcare profession, the public safety profession, uh, as well as other governmental functions. And uh, we hope to have more information on that very soon. We are in touch with the New York State Department of Office and Child Children Family Services because if we are opening a facility in a place that does not normally have childcare, which is something we're looking at, uh, we need to get their approval. And so they are working with us and the task force is, is, is handling that. When we go to Hannah, we'll come back with other questions. Large office places, 
and what is being done for those employees who are really being forced to go to work and their employers may not be abiding by well Hannah as a, the question was what are we what's being done for employers that may not be abiding by the rules whether it's a large one or for that matter a smaller one uh, they have to abide by the rules now we're asking for smart uh, physical distancing social distancing so you shouldn't have 12 people congregated immediately in an area that they might have previously had on an assembly line or something like that it's a little different GM's totally different than it used to be uh, but we are follow, we are asking them to follow the general standards and rules uh, I we do not have a police force that can go out and check every employer so for those that are saying hey I work at a company let you said Geico let's say Geico and I've been in Geico and they generally have separate locate carols for every uh, individual so in, every individual has a workstation they're not crammed in like this and in itself uh, probably is okay as long as they've reduced by 50% if they're not reducing by 50% then they're in violation of the law and then the malls I mean we, we learned from all don't go to a mall I don't know why anybody would go to a mall now the question was the malls uh, I, I would not be surprised if uh, I, you should not go to a mall if you can if, if you can avoid it I understand employees have to go to malls I used to work for Sears years ago worked at the McKinley Mall uh, you may have a responsibility but it's also incumbent upon those retailers to follow the rules that are appropriate for them but if people are dropping their kids off at the mall or just walking around the mall there's no movie theaters that are open can't go to the movies stay home watch Netflix watch what's on your TV uh, we're all in this together but we don't have the ability to send a police force out to police every esta business establishment in this community and for those that are complaining because they think there's too many people going to the malls and their patrons going themselves why are you complaining because you're adding on to it so I would just say stay away from the malls stay away from any large gatherings and that would be a mass gathering remember the CDC is now recommending it was announced by the president yesterday mass gatherings basically being 10 people or larger avoid those that's why we're trying to avoid having the less than 50 it's more than 10. Michael. Mark between the locations that you listed today the locations that you listed yesterday the Sabres making their announcement this morning and the knowledge that there are other confirmed cases of coronavirus out there in the community is it reasonable for somebody to assume in Erie County that any establishment that they've visited, some way, shape, or form, they've been in contact with COVID-19? Uh, the question was based on uh, the, uh, the, uh, in the information we released earlier today on the locations, new public exposures, uh, the ones we talked about yesterday, including airlines, trains, uh, the statement that was made by the Sabres, is it reasonable to assume that you may have come in contact with someone who is positive and that you could be exposed yes it is reasonable we're assuming there are enough people in the community who have it who have not been uh, tested yet that it's being spread if my memory serves me correct we have cases now in the city of Buffalo the town of Grand Island the town of Amherst the town of Clarence the town of Elma and the town of Orchard Park just because your town hasn't been announced doesn't mean it's not in your town and I know Allegheny County has a couple cases that were determined positive other counties are sending us the results just because we don't have a positive from that other county doesn't mean it's not in that other county uh, we are expecting every county every town when it all is said and done to have had cases and that's why it's best to stay away from others if all possible uh, well, I just want to ask those who haven't asked questions so far Ryan so with the new cases that we're looking at and the evidence of community spread and or a change in some of the protocols what about people that were in that, those public exposure areas should they be showing symptoms before they call their doctor uh, or if they were just there uh, um, for those individuals, uh, we recommend that 
Again, they monitor themselves for symptoms. So the question is for those individuals who have been in the areas that we identified where we know that cases have been and they could have been exposed, the question is, uh, sh you know, sh what should they do in terms of getting testing? So uh, what we're recommending is that those individuals monitor their symptoms. Um, they should, you know, take their temperature or just, you know, self-check that see if they feel like they have a fever twice daily. Monitor that they, if they have a cough or shortness of breath, and if they do develop those symptoms, to either call their health care provider if they have a primary care provider or uh, call the local health department, or if they don't have a primary care provider uh, and they, uh, they feel they need a medical assessment, uh, seek care at an urgent care center. So again, um, I think that just because we listed those, those uh, locations that we know there was a, a case of COVID-19 um, doesn't mean that that's the only place in town where there was a case. We have uh, only tested a, you know, a limited number of people in our community and we believe that there are more cases. So that's why it's really important to, uh, to break that chain of transmission by, uh, by enhancing our physical distancing and just stay at home. Don't only limit your travel to essential uh, travel where to get groceries or medicine or if you need to see a health care provider. So Tom and then George. Uh, yeah, we um, we don't have any known contacts with these cases. Between the, ca the confirmed cases. Right. Just for those who are at home, the question was, do we know of a confirmed contact between the individual who uh, got COVID-19 through community spread with one of the other cases that we've identified as positive? And the answer is we do not have a confirmed contact. So uh, it is what you would consider the prime example of community spread. And uh, unless we get other information that shows otherwise, it, it indicates that there's probably someone else out there who has COVID-19 that just hasn't been tested yet. George? Um, the fact that almost 80% of the county residents that you tested came back negative, what does that tell us? That, that there's an overabundance of caution that you set a level of criteria and still 80% are coming back negative or is that a surprise for you? Uh, I'll just repeat the question and let Doc answer it. The question was uh, uh, with over 80% of the county residents have been tested coming back negative, what does that tell us? I, not the person to ask, so Doc. <laughs> so, uh, so remember, um, what we see with these type of outbreaks is a curve. So again, we start from no cases to starting to see an acceleration of cases, and then we eventually see our peak. I mean, this is something that we see every year with seasonal flu. And so uh, with 80% uh, negative so far of those who are tested, of those who have identified a risk of travel or contact of symptoms, um, um, that's where we are. So it just shows us that we're at the beginning of our epi curve. Then we're going to expect to see more and more cases, especially as we test more and more individuals. So again, when somebody has a test result, it's what their status is at that point in time. It doesn't mean that they will remain, if their test is negative, it doesn't mean that they'll remain negative for the duration of this outbreak. It just means at the time that they were tested, they tested negative. And in the future, they could test positive. So, uh, you know, again, it's a false sense of security that if somebody believes that they have a negative test, that they're good and they can, uh, you know, participate in whatever activities that, that they want. Um, it still just means that at that time of testing, they were negative and they still need to take the non-pharmaceutical interventions into account in their, their daily behaviors with washing their hands, staying away from sick people, and all, many of these people were ill, they should stay away from other people, you know, clean the surfaces, you know, we still need to do all that, especially in our homes. So, uh, again, we we'll would probably see uh, start to see a higher proportion of positive cases as we go through our epidemic. Now, uh, we've already gone through a round with everyone. We'll give everyone an opportunity to ask one more question in person, and if you have additional questions, you can leave it with our media staff, and we'll try to answer them. I have to be on a conference call at three o'clock, so we started with Steve. Steve. 
minus the flights, the minimal patients with positive, patients with positive test results, um, the mall has the widest mm -hmm. talk, you know, is there better guidance as to what time frame we're talking about? Because it pairs specific time frames on almost every other location except for the mall. Uh, my understanding uh, is the individual just relayed that they went to the mall that day. I don't know if you have additional information. No, not now. If we get it, we'll share it. I know it's <laughs> it's the largest mall. It's the largest mall in in Western New York. Uh, it generally has the most people. Uh, we know that there was a career fair going on that day. Uh, that was supported by one of the local radio stations, and uh, I wish I could give more information, but we're giving the most accurate information that we have from the individual. And, well, and also in you know reality, um, again with you know what we've all acknowledged is that that um, does it does it really matter because we all know that probably any mall has people walking around with who are infected with COVID nineteen or you know any place that we go where uh, there are a large number of people are positive with COVID nineteen. So because we have identified a place, uh, doesn't mean that uh, other places are where everybody is negative. So I just think we have to go with the assumption. So this is some additional information that may help individuals. You know, especially like put it together if they develop symptoms. However, um, it's now with community spread, um, we just can't assume that there's any safe place, except if we're all congregated in our home and everybody as well. Agreed. No, that, that, mall, that location is large. You've named specific locations at specific times. So it would be helpful if, if you had it, what store they were in and what time period they were at that facility. I agree. And we're trying to get that information from the individual. Uh, I don't, I wish I could provide more information on where they were, what store, uh, for the individuals who've been declared positive and the calls they receive, for some of them, it's, they're very scared. And to think about where they were for the last two weeks before uh, is tough enough as it is. If everyone just thought about, you were then supposed to come up with an exact schedule of where you were for the two weeks before, a lot of us would have difficulty determining exactly where they were. And also a traumatic situation. You've just been told you have the coronavirus, COVID-19. Uh, as soon as we get more information, we'll share it. We can only share what has been provided to us by the patient. Sandra. Um, so just to confirm again, there is only one case so far that you've confirmed that seems to be a community spread case as opposed to somewhere, somewhere else. The question was, is there any, was there only one case that seems to be community spread? Yes. Capacity with regards to the public health lab was a question. What is our capacity? We said we could do about 450. Uh, that really hasn't changed because we have had no reagents and we have no new swabs, testing kits. So we have made, we have a request in through New York Response. We have contacted the manufacturer of uh, the, the test kits, so to speak, the swabs to deliver more. Uh, there is unfortunately tremendous demand across the country. Uh, so I was on the phone with the governor's office earlier today to find a way if we could get additional kits. We certainly have enough to complete the work today. Uh, we're hopeful that we will have enough to complete the work tomorrow that is going to happen. But when we only had 450 to begin with, and you see we've already tested and have samples of uh, 225 pending, and we've performed uh, 86 on county residents, so we're over 300. And remember, we've done tests on other counties as well. We're coming up to our capability. The governor's office is aware of that. Uh, and we are, this is an issue we're dealing with. You're running out of the reagents? And the swabs. I, to that point, I do have a question regarding someone who, who told me that she was told by her primary care doctor when she wanted to get tested, they called the Erie County Health Department who said the health department is too overwhelmed to test someone who is low risk, even though she's exhibiting fever of 102 and a dry cough. Are you turning people away who want to be tested and whose primary care doctors recommend it be tested? No, if, the re if the recommended and it meets the protocols, it will not be turned away. 
they may not be able to get tested that day. They'll be scheduled for a testing. The question is, are we turning people away? Uh, some individuals, criteria. you have to meet the, there was a criteria change. If they called three days ago, they may have been, if they had just had a fever, but did not travel overseas and did not come in contact with a known positive, they would have been a low risk. But now we've changed the criteria. So if they talked three days ago with someone in the public health lab, uh, the, they may have gotten an answer, they are a low risk, we're not testing you at this point. But we have changed the criteria through the examination of what we've seen, including now a known case of community spread, so that if you meet the protocols, uh, you will be tested under the proviso that we have the ability to do the test. And as I just noted, uh, while we still have enough test kits and reagents to do the tests that are scheduled today and hopefully through tomorrow, uh, we're not cert certain based on the increasing demand uh, that we'll be able to meet that unless we get new supply. And we're not the only ones that are dealing with that. I know from talking to my colleagues elsewhere, and I'm not just talking about New York State, in the country, that this is a significant concern. Ryan? I would like to give you an answer that says yes, but the question was, do I know if and when we'll be getting more test kits in? And the answer is I cannot answer that in the definitive, no. Michael, one question. Regarding the local malls in the area that people have still been going to, do you have the authority to shut them down, and is that something you'd be considering if you do have that authority? Well, I have a lot of authorities under the uh, state of emergency, and the question was what authority do I have to shut like local malls down? If they're following the protocols under New York State, and their people are practicing safe social distancing, then there should be no reason to do it. If a mall decided to do a giveaway, come in to the first 400 people and get a free thing, well then, yeah, they're violating the law and they could be shut down. And it's really the commissioner of health who shuts them down because it's the commissioner's orders from the Department of Health that shuts it down. When the sheriff's office and the Buffalo PD went out two nights ago uh, with sanitarians from the Erie County Department of Health, uh, it was an order that was signed by Doc Burstein saying this, and the place was listed blank, the sanitarian would fill it in, is closed due to violation of the occupancy laws. The same would apply to that. The emergency powers that are delegated to me are also given to her as our health commissioner to act appropriately under the law. Uh, Tom and George, you guys have other questions? Yes, we'll get back to you with the social services question. There was a question on social services. Uh, if you can provide that to Peter, we'll get that back with you with the latest. Uh, there's a lot of actions that were taken by social services. We are still required to provide some basic services, uh, emergency services to individuals, including homelessness and things like that. Uh, so, so our offices are open that generally face the public, but there's extreme limitations on them. But we'll get back to you with the full details. Uh, as soon as we get more information, we will certainly provide it to the public. Uh, we're, we have another test that I know is running right now at the public health lab, but I don't know the exact timing on it because it got it started later because they had to take out the test and do the analysis. Uh, I want to thank uh, ECMC, Tom Crochochi and his staff because uh, we have an overwhelmed public health lab, as you can imagine. They've been going straight for days now, uh, and they've offered additional assistance through uh, individuals who are qualified to work on this machines. We have one individual who's qualified to work on this machines from our central police services, so I thank them for offering additional help. Uh, at this point, it's not an issue of staff, it's an issue of will we have enough reagents and swabs to be able to perform the task at hand. Uh, and we're going to continue to advocate and push for that. And I want to thank the governor and his staff for the great work that they've, they've been doing. Uh, governor Cuomo is really leading in some ways the nation with the actions that are taken. Uh, our office is in concert with them. I am not on it right now, but right now his office is having a conference call with key officials locally. Uh, and when I get upstairs, I'm going to find out more about it, and then I'm going to jump on another conference call with others. Uh, I know Doc is the same, and we have a lot of work to do. If we have more information tonight with regards to tests, and if any come back positive, we will announce that th uh, through the same medium as we've done before, uh, a press it release with advisory, and then we'd have an update. The one thing I will note is this goes along, and we're going to have many, many, many more. It's going to be tough to keep track of, I mean, keep, to keep constantly have press conferences to announce every single one. So we'll probably be doing this on a once a day basis. We would not announce after every new case. And we'll provide as much date detail as possible. And the goal, as I said earlier, is to have a, a pool camera here. We're going to work with our partners in radio and, and, and print media to find a way to best provide but we're trying to reduce the number of individuals in this room. I don't want to be in a situation that they're dealing with 
in Suffolk County now where their county executive is in quarantine. Steve is okay. He's not showing any symptoms, but he did come into contact, Steve Malone that is, uh, close contact with an employee who does have COVID-19 as well as some of his key personnel as well. We're trying to eliminate that from happening here. We also don't want members of the media to potentially get a transmission from someone else. So we're going to reduce the number of people in the room. And finally, to the people of uh, Western New York, once again, uh, we are in solidarity together. We're united in our efforts to fight this. It's tough to fight a virus in ways we are doing it. The recommended ways are the best ways that we know how without a vaccine. So I ask everybody, once again, be united. Be in solidarity with your brothers and sisters in the greater community, in the state, in southern Ontario, who also have cases as well, uh, in the world. And show your solidarity with others that you're taking these things seriously by flying your flag. Put your American flag out every day so that your neighbors know that you do take this seriously and you are in solidarity with them. Thank you, everyone.